Good. So sampling and probability today is really where we are moving forward now. So we did now descriptive statistics. We understand now central tendency, variability. We understand how to aggregate data from uh, basically a raw data score, raw entries in a data set. We know how to aggregate them into a tabular format. We know how to show them as graphs. We know about histograms. We know about frequency polygons, which is basically a smoothed function showing the distribution that you see in the histogram. And we know about dot plots. We know about uh, other ways to depict uh, central tendency and this, uh, variability uh, using box whisker plots. And we've seen scatter plots with the individual points. So you know all these uh, ways to approach that in a descriptive fashion. So the next part of statistics is really inferential statistics. And the inferential statistics, as the basic understanding is, you need to understand what does the data tell you when you look at it in a certain way. And you essentially do that with something that is called hypothesis testing. And you're testing hypothesis that you're phrasing in a certain way. And we will talk about this later on. And these hypotheses are to be tested, and they're tested with a quantification of probabilities. And for this very reason, probability is a super important topic of today's class and also sampling. We talked with sampling about, um, in terms of sampling, we talked about uh, populations and samples. So when you collect a sample, uh, this is basically a subset of your population. You're doing that for organizational, logistic, financial, practical reasons because you can't start an entire population and you need to sample this in a way that your sample is representing your population. So when you have the US population and you only sample this based on, I don't know, uh, one part of New York City, this will not be representative of the US population, just as the most simplest example and the most visual and, and uh, easiest comprehensible example. So a random sample would essentially be a sample of the US population where literally every, every member is somewhat represented in that sample. And as you can see already when I'm saying this, it's, it's virtually impossible to really realize that because you would need to consider factors like age, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, uh, I don't know, diabetes, comorbidities, whatever, you name it, every characteristic of an individual would need to be represented in a sample. And it's virtually impossible to ever find this represented. So random sample would require a large number of sample members or people in your sample. And it would need for you to sample from different geographic locations, from different socioeconomic, all of this would need to come together to really have a full, what we call generalizability of your sample. So that representativeness to your population. And that's really the problem because in 99% in, in of all uh, research, you basically, you're somewhat stuck with a so-called convenience sample. And the convenience sample is, as the name implies, you want, to do, uh, you want to do a study. For that study, you're questioning people about their general happiness on a scale from one to five. Uh, and you're going in the closest mall and you ask the 100 people that are walking by on their way to the next electronic store. And you ask them, how happy are you? And you get a certain sample. You get 100 entries in your sample. And this will just not be representative of the overall happiness of the US, right? Makes sense. But it was convenient for you to collect that sample. So if you go in a mall, if you go anywhere in a geographic location, this will always prompt you to think of a convenient sample. And the problem is uh, that most research is done basically, uh, and I hate to say it because it's, it's unfortunately true, but a lot of research is done on convenient samples because that is the population you have access to. In many cases, in many studies, it's also kind of self-selective study, uh, self-selected samples where basically uh, individuals have chosen to participate in the research. And so it, it becomes very complicated. And 
of note, there's actually this work out there that actually has done a systematic comparison of research that was done on various drugs, on various interventions that are commonly used in the overall population. And all of these trials that have shown uh, the effectiveness and the efficacy of various interventions in medicine basically were done in a population that was younger, more likely male, more likely college educated, which is not representative of the overall Medicare population. So you're basically you're studying a sample for most of the research that is not representative of that population you're actually using this intervention then on. So it is, it is certainly a problem, but this is, this is, bringing the conversation on a very advanced level, essentially, what you will need to know that there are two differences. So there's a random sample that you draw randomly from all different locations, from all different walks of life, and you have the entire population represented in your sample. And you have a convenience sample that's drawn for a certain convenience reason. And mostly it's geographic accessibility or it's uh, in some organizational accessibility. Uh, like studying your colleagues on a campus for a psychology and master project, studying uh, people in some, in, in, in the close by more, studying people in your town. These are all convenient samples. Good, a random sample would be, every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected into the studies. And random samples are almost never used in social sciences for the aforementioned and outlined reasons. It's very difficult to assess a whole population from which to uh, select the samples. And that is usually resorted to census data. And even census data has its problems. So for example, if you have very, uh, if, you, if you go back to the last census data that has been published, that's the 2010 census under the, uh, uh, one of the previous administrations, which was a great census that they had absolutely fabulous data. They have data like, for example, air condition density within certain regions of the US. That's like fabulous data. And they, 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 they queried this data from individuals and they queried this data also from uh, the, the, the numbers of electronic stores that sold air condition, uh, air condition systems uh, within certain regions of the US. So you have all this data available and you can utilize this data for various purposes. So there's a lot of generalizable data out there but it's, it's always hard to get individual responses. So as I said, it's difficult to assess the entire uh, population, but, uh, and that's even true for census data sometimes. You have a convenient sample. So those are samples that uh, participants were readily available, readily available and also willing to participate in your research. So even if you have uh, a study where you have what we call a, a, a very low recruitment efficiency. Recruitment, if you have a, a participant in your study and you ask that individual to participate in your study and he says, yes, of course, signs the so-called consent form, then you have recruited that patient into your study. And recruitment efficiency is basically a term that describes from the number of uh, people in the community or patients in your unit or patients in your clinic that are eligible to participate in your study and those that you have approached and those that are actually willing to participate in your study, that's called recruitment efficiency. And this recruitment efficiency, if that is very low and not many uh, individuals want to participate in your research, well, maybe you should rethink your intervention Point one, point two, this will create also uh, a convenient sample, basically restricting the number of individuals and restricting this to a very specific pool of patients, creating what we call in epidemiology and, and, and trial design a selection bias to create a so-called bias. And we will talk about bias a little more. Uh, okay. So the reason why we use convenient sampling over full random sampling is basically monetary, organizational, and logistically, and just because it's accessible. It's an accessible, willing sample of your population. That's why you're using it. 
So a convenient sample might not represent the larger population. So it's really this representativeness that, uh, that is the limitation of convenient sample. The technical term for this is generalizability. Generalizability of insights that you have gained from your sample uh, to your population. Also called external validity. External validity represents the generalizability or representativeness of the sample and the insights that you have gained from studying your sample. This is that uh, contradistinction to internal validity, which essentially refers to the validity of your methods that you have used for analyzing your sample. So external and internal validity. I'm not going too deep into the epidemiology, but I think it's important to understand the, the broad strokes of these terms, what they actually mean and imply. So when you have a low level of generalizability, what is, uh, and you have what, what I labeled before as a selection bias, what can you do? Well, you, you conclude your study, you, you, you find your insights, and then you basically, either you study it again in a different sample, or you hope that one of your colleagues on the West Coast studies the same intervention or somebody from Japan does the same, or somebody from Europe, or somebody from uh, Argentina, or somewhere else in the world, somewhere else in, uh, in, in, in the, the country you're in, or somebody else studies the same insight. And this is basically the foundation of research. The most important thing to establish causality of an, an association in research is to find it replicated or replicatable. That's really one of the foundations of causality in research. So generalizability, so that the, the limitations of limited generalizability can be mitigated, not overcome, but mitigated with replication. Um, so we talked before about that low recruitment efficiency when you have just a study intervention where, um, where patients just don't wanna participate in your study. So as a little bit anecdote from my uh, own work, so I do research in dialysis therapy. Dialysis is administered three times a week to dialysis patients, to a patient with renal failure. We conducted a study basically trying to recruit patients that would be randomized in either coming three times a week, just like the uh, normal conventional regimen, and we tried to uh, recruit them for a study that meant to randomize them either to the conventional or to a more frequent regimen where they would come in six times a week. So now coming in six times a week in a dialysis clinic for two and a half hours is obviously not, it's, it's a burden, right? Not only is it the burden of the treatment per se, it's also the burden of getting there, it's logistic problems. So it's a lot of burden for the patient and we had a recruitment efficiency that was as low as 16 percent so we approached we approached all together like 5800 patients all over the us only 16 percent of these eligible patients participated in it so it's a very low fraction uh, that that essentially will participate in studies that put a lot of burden on the individual right so this is why it's important to understand that also a volunteer sample, a self-selected sample, or, uh, where, where there's some own will involved or where there's, there's some disadvantage of participating will create also a, a selection bias, which is even more pronounced in a volunteer sample where the patient actually can actively seek out to participate in your, in your research. And the example that are given here is crowdsourcing and online network sampling, MTurk. So crowdsourcing is basically where you have a survey and you find a channel, a platform in the internet where people go because they like to participate in this kind of service. And there are actually platforms like that. So you can go there, you can fill out the survey and the psychology student somewhere in the world gets some insights and is actually happy because uh, he or she can use that then for her, his or her master thesis. The problem is if you're such a person who likes to fill those out, you're a very specific person, right? You're not, you're not somebody who 
never has done a survey, you're not naive to the research. So your answers may differ from that of just somebody met randomly on the street and said, like, okay, give me this quick, I filled it out. It's a different group. There is potentially some bias. The same thing with online network sampling. So that's even more pronounced because if you, uh, if you do that with a mechanical Turk, that's actually, <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's a large online distributor that actually has MTurk. I'm, I'm trying to show where to use brand names, but basically, uh, so the MTurk is basically from this large online distributor, uh, a way to make some money. You go in and you fill out a survey and you, you get 50 cents for a survey. So when you do that, your answers are not generalizable. And that is really where the trick is. Even worse so, when you look for testimonials, you know testimonials, you have read testimonials 100% for different reasons. If you read, again, a brand name, look at that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you read the testimonial for whatever product you may be seeing on the internet, there's a lot of problems with testimonials because who is writing a testimonial? Somebody who is like over the moon for this product or so like that's that's like the best nail polish ever seen on planet Earth or somebody who really hates the nail polish. These are the two groups that are most likely to write a negative or a positive review or testimonial. That person that's like, yeah, but the nail polish was okay. It wasn't like, wasn't really blowing me off my feet, but like it was okay. I can live with it. That person is not going to write the testimonial. So keep this in mind when you read testimonials and when you base your decision making based on this testimonials. What's actually a little bit, what's a little bit less biased? Uh, so testimonials definitely are biased, and that's biased sampling. What's less biased is when you go, for example, on Google Review or you go somewhere on a review page where you don't write a testimonial. So that's a little bit taking the problem away because there you have like a star system and you, you click like somewhere along the stars, whatever star rating you want to give it. That's a little bit more credible because essentially it takes you exactly like two seconds to click on that star. It's a different, it's a, it's a different thought process where you would click on that star. And you are likely more honest than when you have to write an actual review. But that's a different conversation piece, and that's that's more the psychology between that. But I understand the testimonials are an, uh, an, an example for bias sampling. So, and now, uh, and, and a very important conceptual difference is here with random sampling versus random assignment and random selection. So random sampling is, as the name implies, it's sampling. So you sample, you create your sample based on like picking random people out of a population. That would be random sampling, which we have learned is never done. But then when you compare two different groups, let's say you want to compare any form of intervention. You want to compare uh, exercise and their effects on happiness. And you, 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 you have one group of uh, participants that you will randomize to exercise every three times a week. And then you assess their happiness at the beginning of your study when they come in and they haven't exercised yet. And then again, after six months, after they did three times a week. And you have a second group where you do nothing and you basically you, you, you do the happiness assessment at the beginning of the study and then again after six months. And then you compare how did those evolve over those six months. So that is the example of a randomized design, of a cohort design. You can now do different things. So you can have them self-select, as we have learned in chapter one. So you can have them self-select or you can randomize them in each group and minimize confounding. We've talked about that in chapter one. You can also randomly select them into the group. So you can say, okay, so like I'm selecting this individual to be part of that group, that individual be a part of that group. So you select them randomly and you're assigning them to a group while you're selecting them. That's not really how this is done. It's basically, it's more of a random assignment. A random assignment means like you give that individual uh, a consent form, individual participates, 
and then he or she gets a number and that number was already predefined to be in that group versus the other group. So that's the difference between random selection and random assignment. So you're not randomly selecting. You're not sending one research coordinator out and like you only select now for that group and you, the other research coordinator only for that group. So you basically, you're assigning them based on random assignments rather than random selection. Any questions on that? It's important to understand random sampling, random selection, and random assignment. Yes. So random sampling is sampling, creating a sample based on uh, developing that sample of your population. So that's a subset of your population. Random selection is where you select individuals randomly from a group for a particular intervention group in your trial. So you basically you assign them while you select them. A random assignment is basically you're selecting naively individuals and you give them a certain number and that number has been assigned already a certain randomization scheme. So, and the, the research coordinator doesn't know that number or that assignment. So it's basically the assignment is happening randomly and you're not selecting them randomly into the group. And random selection, it's, it's virtually never used. I, I, I have never read the study where this was used, to be honest. So it's, it's just, this example was given because it meant to kind of illustrate the differences between random assignment and random selection. So any other questions on that? If not, then let's get started with probability. So what is probability? Probability is basically uh, an estimate of uh, an event occurring over the number of events that could potentially occur. So the arithmetic description is success over trials. So if you're rolling a die and you want a six, you want to quantify the probability of a six appearing on top. You have a probability. So there are six different. Okay, somebody help me. Uh, is it planes, planes, uh, the sides of a, of, of a die? Planes? Faces. Yeah, faces. Faces is the best one. Okay, thank you. So you have six different possibilities of things to occur. These are your trials. If you want a six to appear on top, that's only one out of six. So it's one over six, that's your probability. If you do this two times in a row, yeah. firstly, do you think the probability for this, so let's say for the first time, it did not come. Do you think the probability for the second time is higher, lower, or the same? Yep. It must be the same. And that's kind of the, uh, the gambler's pitfall where they have in, in Las Vegas at the roulette tables, they have like this, this list of numbers that happened before. And so you, you literally, you hear when you stand next to this roulette tables, you hear people say it's like, oh, there was like rats 10 times. It's gotta be black now. No, absolute rubbish. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's labeled the gambler's fallacy. And so there is, you cannot predict the outcome of a roulette table. And when it comes to randomness, and now I want to go to something that I have posted here, which I, I like quite a bit. So this is a book that I enjoyed a lot. So if you want to learn, uh, read a bit about probability, it's, 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 it's a nicely written book. It's not too complicated. It's called The Drunkard's Walk, How Randomness Rules Our Lives. It was written by Leonard, uh, Leonard Mlodinov, uh, an, an, an absolutely brilliant man, a theoretical physicist, written with Stephen Hawking, a couple of books. And uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a very nice approach to the topic of randomness for lay people to understand, essentially. And so he's outlining the one thing. So to illustrate, the concept of randomness, how hard it actually is to create randomness, 
it's uh, they have to actually take randomness out of the shuffle of an iPod. And the reason for that is actually interesting because if you have absolute randomness, uh, you essentially have a considerably high probability that you have uh, two songs playing after each other, so in, in a consecutive order. Uh, so there's a considerably high probability. So if you look at this and you want to define it, you want to recognize randomness, um, and you want to think that that shuffle button on your iPod, no, this is not iPod anymore, no, it's an iPhone, but it was written a while ago, and Steve Jobs uh, has said that quite a long time ago. So they had something that had to feel random, although it was less random than it actually would have been if it were truly random. So let that sink in. <laughs> so it's actually true randomness is actually very hard to achieve. It's, it's if not even impossible to achieve. And on a side note, you can actually quantify randomness. There's actually a marker called entropy. So some of you that uh, have an interest in chemistry may have heard of entropy. Uh, so it's actually, it, it can be quantified and for some certain variability measures in different contexts, uh, it's actually used as a metric. So they had to actually make it less random to avoid two songs play uh, in a consecutive fashion, because that would feel for the, for the uh, user of that device as it not being random. Just as a fun detail on the side. Yes. Okay, like three minutes on, on the fun detail. Uh, also, if you want to read the book, that's actually a fabulous book. Good. Uh, all right, so probability is uh, the success over trials. And this is not only true for a die, this is true for every uh, aspect of life, right? So if, if I have uh, the probability, I want to quantify the probability of success, I need to know what the potential outcomes will be. The trials, so to say. The problem is that probability is, so there is a little bit of, of a lot of misconceptions and there's a lot of biases involved. There are, for example, personal biases, which is a confirmation bias, which means if you find something that you have an inherent belief in confirmed, you will assume and you will base your belief about that probability based on your preconceived notion. So that's a confirmation bias. An illusionary or illu illusion, illusory, uh, illusionary correlation is a correlation that is, again, your own, your own belief that basically results in that for whatever reason. That's like, okay, so I have the talisman of my grandmother and I'm carrying this today and I'm running two minutes faster on my marathon. Something like that, right? So it's, so it's something that is not really real but it's an illusionary correlation. It's a technical term. Then we have a personal probability. So that is uh, the 20%, that, that, that is when I say, as I'm standing here right now, so there's a 20% probability that I'm gonna be home before eight. That is my personal probability. That's my own estimate. It's not solid. It's 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 basically made up on the spot. It's something I believe in, and it's just it's it's meaningless because it's not founded on what is uh, basically labeled as the law of large numbers. And this is where it comes down to uh, an expected relative frequency probability. So trial over uh, so the, the, the success as an outcome over the number of trials is your probability. If you do this a hundred times, a thousand times, your probability will transform into the number of the success happening. Let's think about this. You have... Uh, Let's say uh, the prevalence of diabetes in New York City is 10%. I go out on the street and I pick a random person, random notably, random something. I pick a random person 
what is my probability that this person is going to be a diabetic? 10%, right? True. If I pick a thousand people and each of these individuals that are picked had a 10% probability, out of my thousand people, how many are diabetic? Hmm? Uh, yeah, give or take, right? But it, it's going to be somewhere around 100, correct? Because each of them had a 10% probability. And that is the law of large numbers. And this is actually being utilized for uh, analytic purposes, because essentially what you do, if you draw, let's say uh, you, you're drawing 20 different samples of a thousand, you get, you get 101 with the first sample, you get 99 with the second sample, you get 96 with the third sample, you get 110 and, uh, with, the, with the fourth sample. So let's say you do this a hundred times, you get hundred different sample percentages of diabetics. So you get hundred entries and the distribution of these hundred entries will actually follow a normal distribution. So that's how you use this for, uh, for analytic purposes. That's a binomial distribution, but that's, that is something that comes, uh, will actually not even be addressed in this class, unfortunately, because it's a super important topic. But this is the law of large numbers. So if you if you draw a large number of uh, individuals or you do something very frequently, like rolling a die a hundred times, you basically you have one over six multiplied by hundred uh, as a probability that you will have uh, or that will be the number of times you will roll a six. So it's hundred divided by six, which is. 16, 16 point something, 16.666 periodically. And so you will have 16 times a six. So that's the law of large numbers. What is the most important things for that is the thing for that uh, to happen. So this law of large numbers that you actually have an expected relative frequency probability. And please remember that. So that's basically the transformation of a probability into a frequency. Uh, it's independence, because if my if my first and my second sample that I'm drawing is in any way correlated and in any way associated, you don't find uh, the real expected relative frequency probability in your sample. So you basically you are you're kind of you confounding your uh, assessments and this is called and this we will never talk about we will not talk about this in this class but this is called a quote unquote conditional probability so you basically you have a previous event inform the following event is bayesian statistics so independence of each sample that you're drawing and of each uh, each trial is very important in this context yes please Understand what expected relative probability is. Well, you have a probability, and you have you increase the number of trials, so you have a probability of rolling a six on a die. That the probability is one over six. If you do this hundred times, you have you have hundred mutually exclusive independent events. And that will be other one, other two, other three, other four, other five, or six. So the probability for a six is one over six. The probability uh, and the number of, of times a six will roll in your 100 attempts. And you can all try it tonight at home. It's like, it's, it's a nice evening entertainment. Should be somewhere close to 16%, uh, 16%, 16, 16 times out of 100. So you say six out of 100, that I'll roll a six. It's 100 divided by six. So for each of the, so it's one over six multiplied by 100 times. So the probability in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an increased number of trials that you do that, you basically you find your probability reflected as the number of successes you will observe. Think of the diabetics. 
think of the diabetics. It's, it, it's maybe easier. Maybe the diet is not the best examples. If, it, if you have a prevalence of 10%, you have a 10% chance to bin, pick a random diabetic. If you do this 100 times, you will have 10% of your sample to be diabetics. But the problem is you need a real random sample to have a representation of your population. And that's where, where the circle shows us back to, I need a random sample. Otherwise I have a biased sample. Does that make it clearer? A little bit? I know it's a little bit of a, a jump, but basically when, you, when, you, when, when you're dissecting this, so you have an expected relative frequency. A relative frequency is nothing else but a percentage of your population, of your sample population. So you're expecting a certain relative frequency in your sample based on the probability that you have for the individual that you're drawing into your sample. So that's dissecting what's written here. And I know it sounds a little bit more complex than it is, but this is what these four words imply. I hope that made it clearer. Good. So we know the number of total, uh, the total number of trials. That's our sample of hundred. Uh, we know a prevalence estimate in in in, in New York City. We know that approximately ten percent of the population have diabetes. So we know uh, that, and then we're counting the actual successes and we're dividing this by the number of trials. So that's how you get to the probability. Based on the probability, so confidence is, so this thing here, personal probability. So when I say I have a 20% probability that I will be home before eight, that's my own confidence that I will be home. So 20% is rather low. So this is a personal probability. This is not evidence-based. I didn't measure this over the last uh, four years uh, teaching at Yeshiva. So this is basically just a guesstimate. That's personal probability. So I am not very confident I will be home before eight. And if I have a more realistic estimate of a probability, then I can make a more solid estimate about my confidence. And we will do that in chapter eight. We will be talking about confidence intervals. And we will quantify and define a certain probability with which we are confident that a certain event or a certain condition will be true. And I'm not, I'm not gonna go anywhere close to that because that's gonna be more confusing than helpful. So, but confidence reflects our confidence in a certain event or a certain condition to be true based on the probability. And if this probability is a personal probability, then it's debatable, but it can also be a probability that has been quantified and it reflects our confidence in something to be true or not. Inferential statistics is now basically using the rules of probabilities to test hypotheses. So you're making decisions. Now, what decisions are you making? Can be various decisions. If we are comparing two groups, we are basically thinking that there is, so we have, I don't know, we have uh, people that exercise compared to people that don't exercise. Are they happier? We don't know. We're testing this. We're testing this and we're developing a so-called null hypothesis. A null hypothesis is a hypothesis where we're assuming that there's no difference. That is the default hypothesis. So we are approaching research under the assumption with the hypothesis that there's no difference between those two groups. And we're testing this, and then we're getting a probability that is essentially reflecting that there indeed is a difference. So we're utilizing hypothesis testing to quantify the probability that there is a difference. This can be in the context of uh, experimental studies or inter interventional studies or randomized or not randomized. This is done with a control group or an experimental group. So one gets the treatment, one doesn't get the treatment. We're comparing these two groups. 
uh, under the uh, approaching it by expressing a null hypothesis that there's no difference between the two groups and the research or alternative hypothesis that there's a difference. And then we're using probability to test which one's correct or which one is likely correct. If we are testing that, we have so basically everything evolves around the null hypothesis. So this is the centerpiece of our research. The most important thing is you need to be able, and when you look at questions in the context of, uh, of your quizzes and exams, you will need to understand how to extract the information on how to express and how to interpret the null hypothesis from the question. So there can be questions like, uh, I don't know, Professor so-and-so studied the, 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 the wagging uh, of a dog's tail. Uh, what did he want to study and what's the null hypothesis? Uh, it's it's going to be very, how should I say, very, very specific use cases and very specific examples. And you will need to read the question very carefully and you will need to be able to understand what will be the likely null hypothesis from that research. Um, if you're rejecting the null hypothesis, you are concluding that there is indeed a difference. There is a difference between uh, my experimental group and my control group. If I fail to reject the null hypothesis, then I conclude that there's no difference. Then I accept the null hypothesis and I fail to reject it. So this is a little bit tricky because the angle at which you're looking at, you basically evolve that all around the null hypothesis and only when you're rejecting the null hypothesis, you assume that there to be a difference. And when you, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's the same thing in a table format. So, okay, so if you have null hypothesis, you have hypothesis that there's no change or difference. If you fail to reject it, then this one is actually true. If you have a research hypothesis, you have a change of difference, if, and the decision is made that you're rejecting the null hypothesis. So we're quantifying the probability of the uh, null hypothesis as being true, and then we're rejecting it based on the threshold of that probability that we assume to be appropriate for the research question asked which is in 99% of cases in the published literature, 5%. As soon as the probability of the null hypothesis to be true is less than 5%, you're rejecting the null hypothesis. That's the quote unquote p-value threshold that everybody talks about exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, you certainly, you will, you will read that in every research paper. A p-value less than 0.05 or 5% was considered to be significant because a difference is uh, a difference in the research process is quote unquote significant if that threshold is being met so now if you reject an null hypothesis although it's actually true you're doing something really terrible right uh, and that is called a so-called type one error so in the type one area, you're basically saying, okay, so there's a difference between my, my control group and my intervention group. And you're actually absolutely wrong making this conclusion. So that's a type one error. Can I just speak with your variable? Yep, yeah, yeah, it's one of the reasons. Uh, the more common reason is, um, the more common reason is actually that you in, in introduce it yourself by basically studying smaller subsets. And these smaller subsets may have some characteristic that confounds your analysis, as you say, and basically leads them to you rejecting what you shouldn't reject. If you, and, and, and the opposite now is equally problematic because that is a type two error. So when you have a type two error, you're basically failing to reject the null hypothesis, although it is actually false and it should be rejected. Equally problematic because think about it. 
let's think about uh, the example where you have the NIH funding a research study for $50 million. And um, there's now a researcher who's subsetting his data, introduces a confounder in his analysis, and basically finds a significant difference between one group versus another, and, and basically thinks like that intervention is like the best on planet Earth, right? Publishes that, then the community will accept this research finding and will basically, hypothetically as possible, they will change clinical decision-making based on this research, right? And that's a problem. So you basically, you have safeguards in place to avoid the type one error from happening. And this is where transparency and open science becomes very important because you need to be transparent about your hypothesis, about your recruitment, about the sample size, about the sample population. So you need to be very transparent about everything and that kind of mitigates that risk of a type one error to happen. Not, not 100%, but it, it all points towards understanding where could these errors be. If you have a type two error, again, same problem, $50 million from the US taxpayer, from the NIH given to conduct the trial. And now, yes? Do they make these errors on purpose or no? No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's actually, they may happen, but they're definitely not on purpose, uh, but they are a consequence of, design mistakes in a type two era, their analytic, there are uh, flaws in the analytic approach of subsets that shouldn't have subset it. So it's, it's, they're problematic, but definitely not on purpose. So if you make a type two era, that is the era where you should have seen a difference because it's, it's just true that this would happen with that intervention, but you don't see it because you didn't study enough people. So let's let's again assume $50 million for, from the NIH to that researcher doing a study. What happens to uh, that study is going to be a forced negative study, type two error. So basically you wasted a lot of money. So this is why trial design needs to take this into account and needs to take into account that there is the risk of both of these to happen. The type one error is uh, prevented by a rigid analytic design where you basically you try to avoid this from happening and you basically you do everything to be very transparent about what subjects did you study, what were the characteristics, how did you study them, what methods did you use. So you're transparent about all those things and you try to analyze things and confirm in all different ways to confirm your insight. That is internal validity. In type two error, you basically you try to avoid and prevent by uh, doing a so-called power analysis, power calculation. You basically, you're studying your statistical power based on estimates you have from the literature and that's how you do uh, conduct the design of your trial. So that's a type two error. And yeah. Hmm? The, which part, type one error? Power, uh, power calculation is basically the quantification of the statistical power, which is basically 100% as the overall probability minus the type two error. So it's assumed to be one or 100 minus the type two error probability, which is assumed should not be greater than 10%. So you mean to achieve a statistical power of at least 90% in the design of your trial. And this is essentially a function of the strength of your intervention, of the effect size of the intervention and the sample size of uh, individuals that you've studied and the variability of, so there are more that comes together. We'll talk about this in chapter nine. And um, yeah, so you're basically quantifying your confidence in the results in a way. Uh, so that's this power. Okay, type one, type two error and the shocking prevalence of type one error. So I talked about it, you're subsetting your data and you're kind of trying to find like this little clusters and this little subsets that actually give you a significant difference, which get you into the highest ranked medical journals. That is the shocking prevalence of type one errors. And 
I'm not sure I 100% agree, but yes, there are there are uh, publications that very much show a, a borderline significant results because they kind of they didn't really massage the data, but they like they did some subsets and then they found a significant difference. And based on that significant difference, they making a claim that is sometimes quite strong. So always question whatever you read. Whenever you read the scientific paper, question it, analyze it, dissect it in all pieces, look at it from all angles, because if you really want to uh, accept an insight, you need to understand each level of that work that you've been reading. So that's all that I have for today. We have seven more minutes. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, just quickly going to be uh, the last minutes I'm going to show you here a little sampling example. So, so module seven, the sampling codes that I have posted is basically loading a library called Ames Housing. If you want to install a package, you need to go here on the right side. You see here the right lower quadrant. Uh, here is a tab called packages. If you click here on install and you write Ames housing, this basically will install Ames housing. You just click on install. A lot of, lot of stuff is happening then on the left lower quadrant. You can ignore that. Uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be finished. And then you can run line number one in this uh, code. The reason why I'm showing it to you is uh, I want to show you how much variation sampling actually can create. And it's it's nice to see because it, it puts it puts a little bit of, of, of color in the equation. So if we start library Ames housing, we are basically now loading the so-called Ames data set into our environment. Oops. And, oh, ah, that's funny. Okay, ls ins row. Okay, so Ames is a data set that is uh, built into R. Um, anybody here from Iowa knows Ames? So Ames is a, a is a town in Iowa. It is Iowa, yeah. Uh, town in Iowa. And they basically went through the Ames real estate uh, register. And they basically have uh, built a data set with all the 2,930 uh, houses in Ames. And you have all this data available. That's, that's literally like from the garage size to the terrace size to, I don't know, uh, whether it has a pool, how large the pool is. So all this information is in there. So you have this data to play around with. And um, so it's 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 pretty cool data set actually. And uh, open intro, the book in your listed in your syllabus has a couple of examples uh, that you can utilize to explore it a bit more. So if we're looking now, uh, so we're loading in, uh, Line four, we're loading Ames into the environment. And line eight, we're basically creating a histogram of the size of the living room. So this is clearly not the New York City apartment because having a living room was up to like 3,000 uh, 3, square feet. That's quite a living room. So um, this is the distribution of the living room area, the living area. Is it living room or living area? Not sure. Well, for living room, 3,000 square feet sounds quite big, actually. Maybe it's living area. But basically, you see the distribution. And the interesting thing is now, when you uh, show this as a summary, you basically you get a median and a mean. So you get a mean of 1,500 square foot, square feet. So that's quite a large living area. If you are now uh, sampling from your uh, AIMS data set, you're sampling now, um, 
you're sampling now from your data set 60 different houses. Replace equals force means once you sample them, you don't throw them back in the pool, but you keep them out. So uh, DF1 is now a sample of 60 from that population of Ames houses. If you do now a summary of that, you basically you get now uh, a mean of 1,655. Do you think that's a good sample? Not great, right? 10% variation between the population mean and your sample mean. So that's not a great representativeness. So the generalizability is not really fabulous. If I do the same now again, same code, same sample, same sample size, and I run this again, I get now 1,596. Bit better, right? Still not great, but better. If I increase now, what happens if I increase the number? What's going to happen now? And that's interesting because that's going to be part of the central tendon, uh, the, the central limit theorem that we're discussing next time. If I increase my sample size, what happens? Yeah. The sample mean gets lower to the population mean because I sample more houses in, and that slowly shifts and gets closer to the population mean. And that's why I like this example. That's why I'm walking you through this in the last minutes, because it illustrates the more you sample, the more representative your sample becomes to the population. That's the, that's, that's the actual idea of this, um, of this exercise. And now, and I'll leave you, and, and this is going to be the last thing I show you in the last two minutes. If I'm doing the same exercise now, I take the samples of six, 60. I do the same exercise and the sample now uh, samples of the size of 600. And I sam no, wrong. No, I, I built samples of 60. So I take 60 houses out and create one sample. And I built a mean. I calculate one mean of that sample of me, uh, of, 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 um, of that one sample. And I repeat this 500 times. Then I get 500 means. And these 500 means look like that. Isn't that the most beautiful normal distribution that we have seen so far in this class? So that's the beauty of uh, repeated sample and replication that if you are sampling repeatedly, you get what is called the distribution of the sample means. And this distribution of the sample means in a perfect world will essentially have in the center your mean, your population mean. And that's the central material in which we're talking about next class. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Yes. Um, I wanted to know why in Excel. Wait, let me just, sorry. I tried to create a table and it did something weird.